about games, aren't we? <laughs> Pubs and games. <laughs> Pubs and games. All right, let's get into it because we could um, we could faff about for a long time. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Faff, faff, faff. You could faff about, boys. Don't you dare demean me with your silliness. And with that, welcome to the Board Game Gateway, episode number 25. Uh, no, I can't do that. Faffing about. Can I do that? I think I can do that. You sure. Why you not? Just catch me off. Uh, I, I, I don't. I, I gotta keep you guys on your toes. Uh, all right. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Board Game Gateway Podcast, episode number 25. We are your entryway into the world of board games, tabletop games and fun times. My name is Neba and I am your host for this evening and I am joined by two lovely gentlemen on these mics. To my right and directly in front of me we have Mr. Blake. Hello, hello. happy to Mr. be here. And Mr. Ralph. Hi everyone. I did actually realise that I said to my right and my yeah, like, front that, that and then I off. totally like then reversed you in the, in the, in the reverse order. <laughs> He's already drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, apparently out of my Jurassic Park uh, cozy. There you go. So, anyway, on tonight's episode, we are going to be having a chat about a couple of games. We're going to be talking about Clank Catacombs. We're going to have a chat about a Great Western Trail. Uh, Ralph's got the second edition, and uh, we decided to have a play of that, and we'll give our thoughts. We also are going to have a look at our uh, Gateway Game of the Week, which this week is Skull. And the reason why we're doing that as our gateway game of the week, because we thought, let's talk about things at the pub. But before we get to that, before we get on to that motion, uh, those topics, we are one man short once again. Mr. Matt is no longer, is no longer again here with us. Uh, he, uh, unfortunately, we think he's got the vid, the yeah, cough, possibly. the 19. I, you know. That's what he says. I think he's just avoiding me. You think he's avoiding I, you? I do. And you know what, Matt, if you're listening to this, I, I sincerely hope you are. Um, I think you're avoiding me and I want to bring you back. So I've written you a little something, uh, an ode to Matthew, if you will, um, to our dear friend. I've written a little bit of a poem for oh. you. So, um, do we need to like put in some like background music for you right yes, now? Yes, definitely. You if you um, could edit some in future neighbor, if you could. Um, I love giving myself more work. <laughs> Let's get to it. All right. So an ode to Matthew. Our friend Matt has the sniffles. He's tired. He's tired. He said he'd be here tonight. He lied. He lied. Why, oh, why is Matt at home in bed? Why couldn't he be here with us instead? <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. That was very insightful. Then. <laughs> like, Matthew, you. please come back to us. I don't know what I've done, but every time I'm here, you're not. So I, I, I miss you, buddy. So... Come back to us. <laughs> Please come back to us. I don't know oh, if he God. wants to come back now. Oh, oh, that was, Ab- that was... Absence makes the heart go from grow fonder. Go, it, it, it goes fonder. It grows. Right. It goes. Gross. God, we're in top form tonight, guys. This well, is going to be a good one. We're talking about drinking games, or not quite drinking games today. Well, well yeah, g- games that could be. Uh, well, maybe we well, can see how it goes. Anyway, um, before we get on to that, uh, I do want to say, Blake, it's lovely to have you back. You we missed you in last uh, last week's episode. Yeah. Uh, you missed out with our uh, special guest Anthony and uh, resident Briscola expert. Um, that was a real. I was a great episode. I had a lot of fun with that one. Yeah, it was heaps good. Um, I sent the link round for, to the podcast to a bunch of the family members, um, and I got some great feedback. Uh, my sister said that was a good podcast, and then in a separate chat, my mom said that was a good podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was really sweet of them. <laughs> Hi, mom. Thank you for listening. <laughs> we, we really appreciate it. Yeah, so I've got cousins uh, on the Central Coast that uh, really enjoyed it. They actually played Billionaire before. Oh, uh, um, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, I can't wait to, to break that one out. That will be a lot of fun. Uh, but my dad actually said I, I did Briscola a disservice. Oh. Or rather ooh. the deck of cards specifically. I said there was only two games that you can play. There's three, isn't there? Apparently there's seven games. Oh. That you can play with them. Oh, okay. So to think about it, these cards have been around for quite some time. There's only seven games you can play with them. It's still still quite small, but <laughs> I like to think of it as a. I'm I'm a very positive kind of guy, and what I've just heard is that your dad has given us six more episodes worth of content that we'll be able to uh, well, I, record in the future. So I asked him like, "Well, we should have got you on the podcast. What do you reckon?" <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Next time. yeah maybe maybe we'll, we'll have to have to wait and see on that one but um yeah he taught me there's a variant of like five hand poker um oh. that, you, that you play with them and mm-hmm. uh, he taught me that and i'm like yeah we need to play this one this sounds great <laughs> yeah i can i can imagine i can i think there's 
look, you know, the guards have been around for ages, so I think there's obviously plenty that we have not talked about or missed out on. So mm. I think, you know, like I'm looking forward to get, like getting Anthony back on, yeah. seizing us another game, or hell, if your parents want to get one. <laughs> If, if your mum would like to join us for an episode, oh, more than welcome. Something tells me if she does come on, it won't be cut off at an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that with with all love. But That's yeah. fine. That's fine. That can be a special. That can be. The, we can break it up. That can be a three parter or four parter. Exactly. <laughs> She'll give us a hey, break. I'm down. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, let's get into the games that we've been playing over the week. And the first game that we want to have a chat about. So we're going to chat about Great Western Trail. We're going to do this one first up. And the reason we're going to talk about that is because the second edition is now out and about in the in the wild i did an unboxing video on that on our channel yeah we did it's on our youtube channel so if you'd like to see that go over to youtube.com and search for board game gateway um you'll be able to see rouse unboxing as well as some other content but we um decided to play it because we have talked about it on the podcast we really enjoyed how it was blake's introduction into the world mm-hmm. of board gaming um but there are a few tweaks to the rules um and we just decided it was time to to play the game so um Blake, do you want to try and give a brief rundown of what Great Western Trail is for the listener at home? Oh wow! Um, and I'll put you on the spot there, but uh, look, I always do the intro. I always do the uh, thing. Yeah, like, brief one. Yeah, um, I mean, um, Great Western Trail Trail is one. Trail. That, trail. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Don't worry, it's the Looney Tunes <laughs> edition. <laughs> Three of us have had it. It's all good. All three of us have had the faux pas already. We've got in a, out of the way. It's in a Elmer Fudd coming out there. Yeah. Um, Great Western. No, Great Western Trails. Um, a little bit of a, a little bit of a different one for me because. I still don't think I'm quite picking this game up, and I think I think it really reflected it in my in my score. Um, but look, basically, Great Western Trail, um, you you've got a game board in front of you, and what you're going to be trying to do is moving your piece up this game board um, from the starting starting through um, little points of interest buildings on the map, all the way to the end where you're going to deliver a hand of cows. Now your starting hand, I believe it's is it. Uh, four, five, four cows, four I cows. believe. Four yeah, to start it's with. basically a big cattle drive. Yeah, so you're going to have a hand of cows, and you're going to try to get to the end of this board, and you're going to sell off these cows. Um, each cow has a numerical value. Um, the only thing is, you can only sell unique cows. So if you have two orange, orange cows in your hand, or two white ones, um, they will only count for one card. Uh, so that's the that's the basic drive of this game. Um, the meat of the game is where you're going to be adding to this board, so either adding your buildings, um, you're either going to be moving your train up the side of the board, which helps making your shipments or deliveries cheaper for you, um, or your what's the the cattle, so the cattle market where you're going to be buying buying, cows. buying more cattle yeah. to increase the size of your well the the value of your deck. You know, more unique cows in your deck is going to increase how much you can you can sell at the end. That's the basic meat and bones of the game. Um, but this game still eludes me. I I just can't seem to pick it up. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. This, this game is... You, you've given a very basic overview and what we're not kind of giving to the audience at the moment is the idea of... So the Great Western Trail or the trail that we're moving from the start to the finish of this trail is basically getting longer every time that we do it mm. because... It's, if you imagine, uh, basically, it's kind of more of like an advanced snakes and ladders. Start here, get to the end as fast and as efficient as possible. The only difference is you can't go backwards in this game. But every time that someone builds a building, the trail gets longer because you're only allowed to move three buildings at a time at the start of the game. So each building has a separate um, power and different abilities that you can do. So you can only activate one building a turn so I know that Blake is going to building X and he is buying up the cattle every turn. Well, I'm going to chuck a building in front of that building. So now he has to pay me a toll just for passing over my building and he's not allowed to use any of the abilities that are on my building. And on top of that, oh, look at this. The, everything costs money, wouldn't you know it? And <laughs> they're very expensive. So every player also has a player board in front of them hmm. and you're trying to buy workers to make things cheaper such as building buildings or moving your train further along the track or you know or um, buying cattle because cattle ain't cheap cattle's expensive y'all i tell you that yeah. much and i think that brings up one of the, the more uh more unique and the more interesting uh, points of the game is when you're when you're delivering cattle to certain cities you can only deliver to each city once um with the exception of kansas city although that's negative points so you don't want to be doing that um, 
But when you deliver to a city, you get to take one disc off that game board, that your own personal player board, which will unlock extra actions or upgraded abilities for you to use. Mm-hmm. Um, so was abilities such as, you know, um, getting extra money, something as basic as that, or moving your train up and forward and back to get Move, extra money. Moving your player further up the game board every yep. turn. Increasing your hand size limit. Yeah, increasing the value of your cattle, all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the game... It's what we like to call, uh, what the, what we call in the biz, uh, it's called a, a, a point salad sort of scoring system, where it's like, there's not just one point track, there's 10 different ways that you can score points. Objectives, how much, like the cattle that you bought, the buildings that you built, how far your train is up the game board, how many discs you got on, how many workers have you built? You know, so many different, like there is a lot of different ways that you can go about this game. And I understand why it still eludes you. Mm. I get it. Ralph, you played it and obviously bought the game as well. I owned the first edition. You bought the second edition. But after you unboxed it as well, you went on a bit of a BGA spree with this game. And you've yeah. played, you've, as you were telling us, you've played a lot of this game. So, yeah, what are we missing? What do you think? And, you know... Give the yeah. people the impressions. So I've overplayed this game, I'd say. <laughs> I need a bit of a break from the Great Western Trail. There's no more cattle left for me to drive. <laughs> See? Uh, but when I initially uh, heard of this game, it was a cattle drive, and I got so excited because I thought it was going to be like City Slickers, where it's yep. like, you know, mm. you, you know, you got your guys from the cities, you're like, yeah, I'm driving cattle. But, like, that's not quite the game. It's actually like a heavy... Euro game. Yeah. Uh, it's not as heavy as some of the other Euro games that we're probably used to playing, but I can't put this on the table in front of a family member and no. say, let's play no. this. Because I've got family that love City Slickers, like my cousin Anthony. He loves City Slickers. We won't be able to play this game. <laughs> like, <laughs> it will be so draining uh, to teach him that, unfortunately. But it's a fantastic game. Um, you can try and do everything, but you won't do everything well. Yep. You kind of do need to narrow your focus a bit. I think so. that might be where my issue is. I, I yeah. try to diversify too much, but it, you get the feeling that it's the game where you have to try and speci- specify yeah. what you're trying to do. You know, are you going to build cattle? Are you going to, you know, monopolize yeah. buildings? You know, what are you, what are you going to try to focus mm. on? And my advice to players is do what you think is fun because mm. everything is going to get you points, yeah. right? So, like, if you want to be that player that gets the best cows and tries to deliver to every single city, don't worry so much about moving your train. Just, you know, um, buy the best cows before other players. Mm. Get Make sure they're all unique. Find ways to get them out of your deck or keep cycling through them. And um, there's a lot of cool things you can do, like... If you want to move your train, there's big points on that train line. If you can get keep get pushing that train down, yeah, you, um, could just, you could just keep pushing your train down and rarely worry about actually delivering something. To like say. yeah, because it's not a race to get to the top of the board. Mm. Um, you can take your time going up that board and yeah. only deliver like four times if you yeah, want I think for at the one whole point game. In the middle of the game, me and you, Ralph, had um, delivered five or six times each, and I turned around and looked at, um, looked at me, and he'd only delivered three times. I thought, wow, like he's yeah really taking his time up this game board it's not a not a race at all but, it's not um it's just all about taking taking it what your pace is what you're trying to aim to do mm. that's the thing there's so many different strategies like there's actually not a lot of variability in the game no. because the the starting tiles differ where they're actually placed but they do the same thing every game um the variability is the the buildings you can build you can like play them on an A side or a B side. You can mix and match them uh, just to make games feel a bit different. Um, However, the general strategy of the game is always the same. So when I play that game now, I think, what strategy do I want to try this time? What do I want to do to see see if it works? But like, if I see, um, you know, Blake and Nia actually racing through it and delivering a million times, I'm probably... Um, taking that into account with the decisions that I'm making. Mm -hmm. Like maybe I need to speed up how I get points in a way. Like, or if I, do I need to keep matching their pace or can I I afford? Like, it's interesting to try different strategies. But like I said, I love this game, but I think I've overplayed it. Yeah, but the game plays it. We played in about, oh, actually, we only played in about, what, an hour? It was way quicker this time. It was like an hour and 50, I think we played in. The first time we played it, granted, we played it at three, but the first time we played it it took us three and a bit. So we, like, but 
again, there were still moments of what do I actually do here? What I do love about the game is that the actual trail as well does have these like diverging paths. So it's all like mm. one trail, but there is like, I can either go left here or mm. I can go right here. Oh, you got it right. Oh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> but like, if I go left, there's going to be all these hazards and those hazards are going to cost me money and I have to pay that to the game board. But if I go to the right, I've got to, Ralph and Blake have mm. both put buildings there and I'm going to have to give them money so would I rather give them money or lose a bit more money to the hazards Yeah. so there's these choices that you have to make and actually building position is actually really important I mean I made, mm. a, I made a, a stuff up once where I put a building down before you two and you went oh well he's definitely going to go down that track now so I'm going to put my building in front of his yeah, building yeah. And then I had to pay you a toll any time that I wanted to go. And it ended down. up being kind of redundant because every time yeah. all of us went down that path, we all had to pay to each it. of you. <laughs> exactly right. So it was all kind of a net net zero there. But the game itself, you, as you said, gives you so many options, but you have to, you kind of have to, you know, really mm. knuckle down on one. Like I went big on the cattle market, and at the end, I didn't know how well, and I don't realize you thought how well I was doing, and then all of a sudden, I dropped forty two points just on cows that were in my yeah. hand. One thing that we haven't actually talked about is the objective system is really cool, which yeah, is, it is every time you pick up, so you start with the game with one basic objective card, and that could be something as simple as, hey, deliver to this place and this place, or hey, get rid of two black hazards on the on the map somewhere, right? With rock fall hazards, okay. Very simple, get you three points. But throughout the game, you can pick up more objective cards. Those objective cards go into your hand of cows, and then they so they start to clog up your deck. Now, throughout the game, you can, at any point when they get to your hand, commit to it. You can say, that's it, all right, I'm committing to this objective card, take it out of my hand and slam it down on the table, and then you are now committing to that objective card. If you mm. get it, you get the points, but if you don't, you get a negative point value. So you're taking that risk. However, what I did is I realized, well, I'm just going big on cows, and I kind of big on cows and hazards. I But you can score objective cards that are just in your hand at the end of the game. Mm. You can clog up your deck with as many of these objectives as you want. Mm. And then you can just choose, oh, I can clear that and I can clear that and I can clear that and just get these victory points. Yep. And that's one of those weird kind of things where you're just like, oh man, but if I take that and I don't finish it, it's like, it doesn't matter. You don't have to commit to any objectives unless you actually take them out of your, your deck. And I think that's a very cool mechanic because mm. it's like, well, do you want to keep it lean and nimble to have cows for delivery? Or do you just like me, I bloated mine up and just said, I don't care, just get me any and all cows yep. in my market. That's all I want. Um, and there's these really cool things. I think um, we'll, we'll start to wrap it up on Great Western Trail, but what are your you know final thoughts on it after, you know, this is now the second time you've, no, third time I think you've played it. Or yeah, yeah, I you've think I've played it. it three or four times, but not none too recently. And I think what's interesting is the, I mean, we mentioned it, you know, you know, closing podcasts last year about how much we've changed as gamers, even just, um, you know, since since I started playing a few, a few years, years ago. But the game from then, you know, being my first game and, you know, playing maybe one or two times in the coming months after that, I, I, I really enjoyed the game back then. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it just feels a little bit different to be playing it again now that I'm more experienced. I'm... I don't dislike the game by any means. I, I have a lot of fun playing it. Um, I get the feeling, though, I don't think that this game overtakes. I think I'd rather be playing something else than this game. Maybe it's just because it hasn't clicked for me. Maybe I'll have that light bulb moment. But Maybe I think, you won't. I think one of the detractors for this game for me is, like you said, you feel like you want to be playing something like City. Because like some, that, that theme feels a little bit loose for me mm. on this one. Yep. It's... um. I feel like if you, with, with your hand of cows, that's sort of the only thing the cattle drive. If you replace those cows with classic cars, aeroplanes, I don't know, houses, any, a market of anything, you could almost reprint the entire game and just have that as that theme. I feel the theme feels a little bit loose. It doesn't old, feel like tied into the gameplay at sending all. Sending his me. airplanes down the Great Western Trail. <laughs> <laughs> no, his De DeLoreans. I know, I know what yeah. you mean. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I really enjoy the theme, but like. Um, I play it with my wife and the way she puts it is you have these cattle of four cows and then you're actually delivering them to a slaughterhouse. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, that still works. But I'm like, I don't quite, it's not quite the same. <laughs> no, they're going to the big farm <laughs> upstate. Look, they're still in my hand. So when I get to take them, I'm just taking them for a walk and a nice leisurely train yeah. ride back to the start of the Great yeah. Western Trail. No, like, I think I agree with you. I, I can see why especially knowing you and your taste, I know why you may not like, be clicking with this game at the moment. But in saying that also, it's really, if you're not, 
it, it these kind of point salad games can feel mm. really loose and loose and goosey. Loosey goosey is what I was trying to say. There, I was going to loose, fast and loose with the, you know, how you approach a game. There's not a very like narrow path yeah. that you are trying. This tight decision space. It's actually here's every. It's a sandbox. Here's everything. Yeah. What are you going to do with it? I mean, I really like it. And I actually want to still play a few more because, again, now the fact we played it in under two hours, I'm like, oh, yeah. if it's an under two hour game, I'm willing to play that. I will say though, set up and put down to this game is, especially in the first edition, is a pain in the butt. There's <laughs> cards here and discs there and stuff there. I mean, that's part of the game, but I, yeah, I tell you, I tell you what, there was um, there was one specific edition. Just the last thing before we move on to this um, to this new edition that I just found outstanding. And that's your little meeple got a little plastic oh, cowboy yeah. hat. <laughs> yeah, and it was, was the good. best thing ever. I, I loved it. Little red cowboy hat. I'm all in now. That's a theme I can get behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really like it. How like the light casts a shadow on the board through the <laughs> yeah, hat. Like yeah. I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The upgrades of second edition, I feel pretty much are all better. Yeah. The setup is 100%. a lot more yeah. smoother than what first edition had. You get these little baggies that sort of balance the game out as well with the, all the uh, things that come out onto the Kansas track there. Um, I still really like this game. I love the theme of it, mm. to be honest with you. Um, yeah. There's a board game called Western Legends, which is a complete sandbox experience. Mm. Um, like, I don't know. There's just something about a Western theme that I really enjoy. Uh, I play a lot of space games, and fair enough, there's games that don't gel with me. Yeah. Um, that, you know, a few and far between, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy this one. I can play this like constantly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'd be, I'm yeah. down for like, like I said, I'm down for a game of this anytime, and especially because I'm the kind of person that once I, if I get a puzzle, especially one that I'm not clicking with, I want to solve that puzzle. Mm. So it's definitely one that I'm. St- very happy to go come back to um I, I guess my point more was that i think there's more there's other games that i'd rather be yeah, playing at that yeah, point definitely. yeah like if you know if you're going for that sub hour game like something like Korra that we played or mm, um yeah, you know, yeah terraforming mars you know one of my favorite yeah, oh, that's games not a, definitely not a sub hour <laughs> game <laughs> no, 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 but like, no, I no. But like look if great western trailer we can keep playing it in under two hours then i'm like mm. man if that's an under two hour game i'd be willing to play it a lot more than i currently have so yeah Anyway, so that was a great Western trail. And now we're going to move on to a game that we've kind of talked a little bit about in the past couple of weeks. But now we finally had a chance to actually play the game in its entirety. And that is Clank Catacombs. Basically the re-release or the sequel, I guess you can call it. The sequel of Clank. Um, even though Clank has had a few, like, like Clank in space. Yeah, there's quite a few different versions. There's a few like, Clank yeah. acquisitions incorporated. But this kind of feels like the actual spiritual successor to the actual Clank game. It feels like they took what base Clank was and said, okay, here's how we can change the game and here's how we can make it better. So, Ralph, why don't you take it through what... I know we've, kind of, we've done this in a previous podcast, but yeah. if you haven't listened to it, why don't you take us through Clank Catacombs for the people at home? Sure thing, Nate. Um, so, Clank Catacombs is essentially a deck-building adventure game uh, where ourselves, the three of us, so three players, uh, plays up to four. But basically, you're going to dive into a catacomb and you've got to find artifacts, which is basically treasure. Uh, Each treasure has has different point values. So you want to go deep into the cave to get the better treasure. And then once you steal an artifact, you actually need to come back out of the cave. Um, But what you do on your turn is essentially you have a deck of 10 cards. Everyone starts with the exact same. And you play all the cards in your hand at once. So there's five cards in your hand and some will let you move. Others will make noise called clink. And the others will have skill points on there, which will allow you to buy more cards and build your deck during the game. So on a future turn, you can move further Mm. or you can do other things. All the cards combo with each other extremely well. Uh, That is a very brief synopsis of the Mm. game. I think it's actually, and uh, that's really all you need to kind of understand as well, which is, you know, if if you don't know what a catacomb is, it's essentially like an underground tunnel system. And one of the- It's a graveyard, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. I, I th- it's not necessarily a graveyard. Catacombs tend to be, I believe, it's like an it's like if you imagine like underneath London, all the different like un- like the old London, like the tunnel systems and stuff. And where like that's kind of what a catacomb is. It's like a lot of those old old style of like sewers and things like that. Is I think a really good way to think about it. But they're mm. generally dark. They're generally gloomy, and they've been rumored that you can get lost in them very easily. And this game does take that and runs with it in spades mm. because. Um, the way that you move around the game board is that we start off with a couple of squares 
And then all of a sudden I can move out of a square and then I have to take one from a pile and add it onto the end of this game board. So the game board gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we went, when we played it, we realized, oh, we're going to need to rotate this 90 degrees because we're jutting it out. <laughs> we're running out of table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to need to jut it out. And so we did. And then you can see the, the map. And what's really great about it is that some rooms have got locked pathways. Some, some rooms have monsters outside of them. Yeah, there's a lot of surprises in the there's catacombs lot, yeah, itself. Exactly. Yeah. There's like prisoners that you can release and little you know enchantments that you can mm. find and little markets that you can go buy items and things like that, which is even which is great. There's even little like teleporters. So if I'm at one end of the the map, I can find a teleporter and and take me to another teleporter anywhere else on the map. Um, the dragon, there is a dragon, so that's the the monster. That's like the reason with the, with clank, which is you have health that you have to monitor as well. And you can be eliminated from this game. So if, you know, every time that you play a card that has Clank on it, it goes into a bag and that bag starts with 20 dragon, black dragon cubes. And then however many cubes of that player. And then every time that a item card comes out with a dragon on it, we have to pull out that however many cubes out of the bag is what we need to at that moment. And if your cube comes out, hey, you just got hit by the dragon who somehow is in every place all at once or multiple dragons in this <laughs> catacomb system. Um <laughs> And so you have to monitor that as well. So you're trying to heal yourself, trying to keep it on top of your clank, you're trying to not make noise. And there is a lot of different ways you can play this as in classic deck builder fashion. Like you start mm -hmm. out really slow and relatively weak, but you can go make yourself really fast. The great thing I really liked about Catacombs is that a lot of the locked pathways you can unlock, but if you unlock it, you unlock it for everyone. Yeah. So it's like, you know, some people could be trailing each other, but then they, you know do things Blake you got a really interesting power that was just like oh, I just uh you know oh the, sorry that's the other thing in catacombs pathways some of them have arrows yeah. that means you can only enter the room from this way yeah like you had a power though that just said yeah forget that rule you can just go that was the most want. fantastic rule <laughs> I could ignore all the all of the path, arrows pathways and just go wherever I wanted um, yeah didn't help me in the end though but <laughs> <laughs> no and so like I won that that one and I you know I got out first and we had that moment of, you know, there was an interesting moment there where, Ralph, you were the last one remaining in. Yeah, and... so, like, I've played this game a lot, yeah, and I, yeah. I kind of realized I was behind, so I needed to be a bit adventurous and really push my luck to try and win, and mm. I died. So that was the... That... <laughs> yeah, it was, you also, you did die, but you were also, your character was the one who was actually allowed, able to remove a lot of... Like heal yourself. You were buying cards yeah. that could heal yourself. So you actually lasted a lot longer in the dungeon, not because you couldn't get out. You were actually really close to getting out, but you were like, "I need to actually do another run. I have yeah. to go to one other place and get another piece of treasure because I think I'm too far behind." Mm. Which it turned out you were. But that game, at one point, you were just like screaming ahead, and you were just like figuring out the catacombs and you were like just grabbing yeah, stuff that's because i like uh when you reveal a tile you can see the path that comes mm. out and i like linking them so like i go down one path and all of a sudden i shoot down the other end of the table <laughs> <laughs> i love creating that sort of pathway in this game <laughs> now ralph has played a lot of clank catacombs i had played clank before mm. but blake you were new to the whole system yeah no, what no, did you think of clank i think catacombs? even in my um list i had clank right at the back of my um gateway list because i just hadn't played it mm. um this game was fantastic i, I yeah. really clicked with this game straight away it was it's a lot of fun the sort of procedurally generated maps where you know you're able to sort of explore was a lot of fun you never knew what was coming around the corner especially for someone who didn't know what cards coming ahead sometimes that can be a detriment for a game not knowing what's coming up because you, you know you can't plan properly you're not sure what to expect i found that that, that benefited this game you know, I wasn't sure what was coming around the corner. You know, it's like you're going through the catacombs. You're not sure what's going to come out next. What's going to, what's the next surprise going to be? Um, all of the cards were, you know, in, interesting. They were, they were useful. The dragon was a fun mechanic, especially it reminded me a little bit of um, the, uh, the name eludes me, the alchemist game, the uh, quack, quacks, 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 quacks the where, you know, you're drawing oh, yeah. out of the bag. Um, and I think, it clicked, clicked for me and we were sort of just drawing cubes and just dropping them onto the table. But knee, once you drew them out and you dropped the cubes one at a time and it created that tension like, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's always a lot of fun with that. But no, this, yeah, this game drew me in straight away. Um, the way you can just customize your deck, all the, all the different cards you can make, the different decisions. Do I go deeper? Do I not? Yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was fantastic. I'd 
recommend this game. Yeah, yeah just I, about anyone. I really do like what it did, did over the original, which yeah. is that the original has a very has a static mm-hmm. map, but then you you change the location of some of like, like some rooms and some treasure location. Yeah. But the the sequence is always the same. Those mm-hmm. those rooms are locked. Go down, probably tend to go. This one I can already see. I'm like. Oh, it would be different every single yeah. game. Yeah. Every game would be yeah, different. Yeah, the replayability is insane. I, I really love, like, when you go into certain rooms, you get those little secrets, the tokens with the question mm. mark. Yeah. Like, even that's random. The old game had, like, two on each sort of space. And right, once they're yeah. taken, they're gone. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, but yeah, I love this game. Um, they've taken the formula and just made it so much better. Mm. I played this game about a month ago uh with my friend damien who um we're organizing to have on the podcast as well yep and um about two weeks later i went ahead and purchased the game Hmm. anyways i have my friend red over who we had on the podcast our very first guest yeah uh quite a while ago now um i i I played it with him two weeks later i get this random message from him he said ralph i did it and he sends me a screenshot that he purchased (laughs) clank catacombs (laughs) and i'm like i accept no responsibility for this and he goes, Ralph, you are directly responsible <laughs> for 100% of the games I own. I'm like, nah, my friend Damien showed me this two weeks later. I bought it. Now the curse is with you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a really great game. And the great thing about this game as well is it takes the deck building formula that was, you know, basically introduced by Dominion and kind of perfected by it as well. But it's it gives new players such a easy like yeah. r- ramp like it's yeah. like okay you can either move or you have two coins to buy something or you put some clank yeah and then you go okay well i guess oh so you like five up to five skill points so then i guess i will i've got five skill points uh i'll, I'll buy that guy yeah what is he and then you look at him and you go okay that's what he does and you put him in your deck you end up shuffling and you get it yeah and then you're like okay oh i know what this guy does now and then i buy another card and i just put him in, and like so <laughs> by the end of the game and I love this about deck builders, is that you are directly, you kind of know what's in your deck because mm. you created it. Yeah. Yep. So like you yep. don't need to worry about everything in the shop and everything that Blake has. Oh, I know Blake's a speedy boy. He's been doing a lot of things. I know Ralph can, you know, he can hit things really hard. I can really heal hard, really Or he can quickly, heal yeah. really quickly. And I'm the guy who can just go and attack anything, mm. right? Like, you don't need to know exactly what cards they have. You just kind of get a feeling that I, he does a lot of movement, all right? Blake mm. moves a lot. Yeah. You know? And I love that about deck builders. I love when you're just like, this is my thing yeah. and you're directly responsible for it. Yeah. And it started from nothing and you are the one in control of it. Yeah. And I think um, the positive with this game and, you know, being able to, I'd, I'd recommend this to almost anyone, but what mm. makes it so simple, I think is unlike a lot of other card games and builders and engines, you know, there's, there's a little bit of that dis- decision space and, you know, for experienced gamers, that's, that's sort of what they'd want where, you know, you're going to have a hand of cards and you got to pick, do I play this this turn? Do I hold off on on this card? Or, you know, you, there's a strategy. I can either do this or this. Whereas this game sort of, you get a hand of five. I'm going to play all five cards, which means I have, like you said, five skill points. I've got three movement and I can, you know, I can pick a direction. It's it's alleviates that decision space a little bit. It just says, okay, I've got these cards. I can do these actions and you can just sort of go and make it your own. Um, and I think that really levels that gate of entry and to make this game a lot of a lot of fun for, you know, for anyone who wants to join the game. Definitely. I, I've played this with like um, my teenage niece and nephew and they got right into it as well. Um, I do want to say this game in particular, there's a lot of new cards um, predominantly around removing Clank. So mm. you're actually not making a lot of noise compared to the previous versions. But um, some of the tiles have little ghosts on them. Oh, mm. the ghosts. And then like you put a little white cube in the clank area and when it goes in the bag and comes out on a future attack, that hits every player. So that's kind of like you can build like a really good deck, but it has a really good way to keep matching that tension yes. all the way to the end, which yep. is fantastic. Um, the designer of this game, uh, I think it was Paul Denham, I think from memory. Um, he designed a game that I'll have to show you guys later called uh, Dune Imperium. Uh, which is in the same sort of Dune franchise. But the game is uh, very similar in that you have five cards. Uh, you do things with those cards, but you also have like a reveal step where you play all your cards. Hmm. So you can kind of feel like, okay, he's taken the Clank inspiration and put it into this game. You can tell it's yeah. the same designer, which doesn't happen a lot where you can tell 
like this is the same designer as that like galaxy trucker is the same designer as pictomania <laughs> you don't quite yeah. feel that but with this you do and it's yeah. really cool to see I want yeah. to play Junior Imperium again. Everyone says that it becomes so much better with the expansion because like, yeah, I, yeah. I kind of bounced off of it on the original. I'm like, and it wasn't bad, but there were some guys like, this is the best game ever. And I'm like, eh, it's okay. But like everyone says, no, <laughs> with the expansion, it completely like fills those holes. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm yeah. going to give it a guy. The, the expansion does, does add a lot to it. The base game is still fantastic, but the expansion does make it better. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we'll leave that for another episode. And um, yeah, so look, I think it's uh, it's all a thumbs up from around us from us here at the table. Clank Catacombs is a great we uh, great game. I wouldn't say it's a gateway game, but it's that that definitely that next step. Yeah. I mean, you could say, I'd it's, say quite... it's a gateway to deck yeah. building for yeah, sure. Yeah, actually, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is a gateway. Like the cards to are them. pretty simple. It's like it tells you exactly what it does. <laughs> <laughs> they all cut. You can't make a bad deck if you tried. Yeah, I, re- I, 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 I well, you, well, you could. But I'll rescind my. I'll I was in my previous argument. I do actually think, as a deck builder, if you want to get someone, to, this is actually probably a really good first yeah. step. In fact, even just from a graphic artistic standpoint, it's probably better than Dominion. I love from... how all the cards have like a really bad pun or oh, a yeah. bad, bad joke to them. <laughs> like, there's one that. called the General, and it's like I always make good decisions, generally speaking. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like just silly things like that. <laughs> okay, look, all right, you, all right, you talked me into it. It is a good gateway game. I don't think it can be recommended. Anyway, so speaking of gateway games, we're going to move on from Kank Clatacomb. Kank? Kank? <laughs> Kank. There it is. Clank Catacombs. You made a foo poo. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need a counter this episode. <laughs> Probably. Oh, God. Uh, so we're going to move from Clank Catacombs to our gateway game of the week, which this week is Skull. And Skull is a great deception bluffing game that is literally played with four coasters. Uh, the way that it works is that every player is going to be given four coasters. And when I say coasters, I legitimately mean the, the game they box, drink, drink they, coasters, they are yeah. drink coasters. This game, I believe, if Shut Up and Sit Down is to be believed, was a, a, a made by like a bikey gang or, or used by like made infamous by bikey gangs because they used to play it because you can just play it with coasters and they used to settle disputes and stuff like that with it. But the game works uh, thusly. You get four coasters. Each three of them will have a flower, and one of them will have a skull. On on your turn, you are going to do one of two things: either put a coaster in front of you, or you're going to say a number. Now you can only say a number after one coaster is in front of every single player, but you play a coaster, or you can say a number. That number that you say is your call for the round, and you are trying to say how many coasters I can flip before. I reveal a skull. The caveat is you have to start with all of your own coasters mm. first. So you have so if I said if we all played two different coasters in front of us, that would be six. And I said, I reckon I can reveal two. And Blake says he can reveal three. And then it, we all pass after that. Blake can then go, okay, he reveals his two coasters. And then he just has to reveal one more. Starting from the top of any deck that... Mm-hmm. Uh, any pile of coasters that he chooses if he's correct and he was able to reveal three coasters he gets a point congratulations blake you're already halfway to winning because you only need two points in this game excellent if you are wrong though and you reveal a skull the player who you whose skull you revealed will take one random coaster from your hand and get rid of it from the game that so now instead of having four coasters you have three coasters and you may or may not have your skull in front of you now. Yep. That's the game. And the first time, I've got to admit, the first time I heard about skull, I went, I mean, sounds okay. I mean, I don't get the hype. <laughs> and having just played it at three players, I had the classic moment of, oh, no. Yeah. Now I need to buy this game. It's so freaking good. It's so good. It is so good because it is so simple and it took you about two or three games blake but that second game or third game when you're like yeah. oh like you because it's a bluffing game right yeah so you are trying to read when people have put down skulls but you're also then trying to get people to bite on a call yeah, yeah. like knowing that i have a skull right in front of me i'm going to call two and then everyone then play stops because no more coasters can go down so then everyone's looking at each other going can I call three? Do I actually have a skull in front of me? <laughs> and it is so good. I, 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 I think bluffing games are inherently just going to bring that out at a table. And yeah, after the first game, 
you know, I, I played the first game. I enjoyed my time. I thought that's a neat, you know, neat little game, you know, and then we played the second round and after a, a couple caught a couple of people out and you feel little traps with some skulls and it just sort of, the whole game fell into place of, you know, what you're trying to do, how you're trying to get people to bite on your little traps and it, it clicked. And I just went, Oh no, this, this game's fantastic. That it's, third game was brutal for me and Ralph because <laughs> you started when I went skull, you played a skull initially every time, but then you made the first call one and then both myself and Ralph bit, you know, I'll do two. Oh crap! <laughs> and then I did the I bit for three because I'm like, there's no way he does it again. But you had your skull sitting there, and you beat you, and we you, we bit right, and you were like, and I'm sitting there just going, are you kidding? Like, how did it happen again? But the best part about that that round was I had bluffed myself. <laughs> yeah, so I think Eel, you lifted all three of them, revealed my skull. But I think after you flipped up my skull. I even recalled back and said, damn it. Because you thought it was a flower. I thought I put down a flower. So you read me correctly. I just one up you and bluffed myself. Sometimes <laughs> I, I don't even look at what it is until the bidding yeah. starts. And then I look at my, what I've got left in my hand. It's the all in play without looking at your hand in poker. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I've had this game for quite a f- few years now. Um, played it so many times. The, the actual box itself goes to six players, but you can play it with any amount of players you have. Um, we just used a deck of cards and we had the ace as the skull and every face card was just a flower. Yeah. Um, so it still works just like that. Um, I think my favorite memory of playing this game, um, we're at like, I think one of my sister's parties and there's a lot of young children around, but um, basically all, uh, there was like five adults playing this game and one of the little eight-year-old girls uh, in the family said, oh, can I play with you? And we're like, yeah, sure, why not? So we taught her how to play. She watched us for a round and then she jumped right in. She won the game twice. She wow. fooled us. She had the best time ever. <laughs> like, and she, it was time to go home. She didn't want to stop playing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a, it's, it's a really fun, small package. Like it's the same. The boxes are basically the same size, even not just to be bigger than cockroach poker. Yeah. But this game is so much fun. Now the caveat is you'd need to like deception bluffing games. If you do not like those sorts of games, I think you'll bounce off this really quick mm-hmm. because the deception and bluffing aspect is the game. Yeah, right? You're trying They're to like, read other players. Yeah, you're trying yeah. to read. You're trying to then also set little traps. And if you don't enjoy doing that, this is not going to be the game for you. However, in saying that, if you like any sort of deception games, it takes a round or two. But as you said, Blake, like when it clicks, yeah. it's like... Oh, we only played it at three. Mm. So the numbers of like, we actually had some really interesting little small interactions yeah. where we like, we all put down one and then someone immediately goes two. Cause I think one of you has put down a flower, but now I just need to guess which one it was. Yeah. And everyone's sitting there going crap. Or the one moment where I put down one and I just went three. I reckon we've all just put down a flower and sure enough, we all had, right? Yeah. Those moments of like crap, right? Like thinking like, Oh, he's just outsmarted me or, like those moments this game has got a, it does have player elimination but at three players we played through it in what like eight minutes yeah per game i, I would really like to experience this game at those higher play accounts because we didn't really get too high in the numbers before people were already calling yeah but i feel like once you you know you get five six seven eight players at the table you're gonna start shouting ridiculous numbers like i reckon i can flip 10 12 coasters <laughs> yeah. without hitting a and skull. And if you can do it, it's so rewarding. Yeah. Honestly, it's it's fantastic. Well, yeah. What's one of those interesting things about this game, though, is like when you do lose your coaster, if you lose your skull, it is so important to keep that information mm. yeah, completely keep it hidden. Yeah. Because the moment that someone realizes you don't have a skull, they're like, okay, well, how many does Ralph have? I can always flip Ralph over mm. and I can add that to my bid. Yeah. And that's one of those very important things, which is there was a couple of times where Ralph went, you know, you know I lost my skull in the first round. I'm like, no, I didn't. I did not realize that you yeah. played that perfectly well. Yeah. Um, Cause there was times where like I put one coaster down and I opened the bidding at one. Like <laughs> it's like to bait someone else into taking it. Otherwise I'm going to win the point anyway, but yeah. I want you to think that I've got my skull. Then. <laughs> yeah. well, you, you got it once, right? Because yeah. you bid one. But because you have to flip over, like you, you just flip, went, it starts with yours. Because yeah. you went, I think Blake and Nebo just both played a skull. Yeah, and he was and I, right. I had, and so <laughs> I, right? So we just went one, and both Blake and I looked at each other and went, nah, I shit. I couldn't, I couldn't say two because then 
but I was trying to get Nee to say two. So I said the yeah. reason I'm not saying two is I think Ralph's got a skull. So, and, but Nee didn't bite. He we both looked at each other. I think we both had played the uh, skull. We, we, both, we both absolutely. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. You've got four coasters. I'm not, I've got three. You can take this hit, right? But that was that moment where you was like, you had one point from one yeah. coaster, yeah. and like, and, and that was the, the, that's that, so that, that's so big in the game. Oh, that, yeah. For me, that was the click moment. That was the moment of oh, you can be like, you can try and get tricky, mm. but if someone calls you out your bullshit way too early, yeah. you've got to be very like the very first coaster matters. Yeah, it yeah. matters because yeah. if someone just goes, yeah, I reckon I can flip four because everyone is like, Ooh, I'm gonna hold on to my skull <laughs> four, like, yeah. oh my god, he just got the point. Yeah, so, but the, the components are really good. They're very sturdy coasters yeah, as yeah. well. Um, the theme is kind of like the Mexican Day of the Dead uh, sort of skulls. Um, but what's really cool is all the colors. So each player has like a color, like blue, green, purple, that sort of thing. But all your flowers are different uh, and or everyone's skull is different. Like mm. you might have a Viking skull mm. or, or just a typical Day of the Dead one. Uh, it just adds that bit of flavor, that personality to it. It's just a bit more fun. Um, I loved it. I, yeah. I think the the, uh, the artwork of it is great. Completely unrelated. How much was this game? Uh, so it's actually about the same price as Cockroach Poker, so about twenty twenty five wow. bucks. Yeah. Um, I've had just a, just about the same amount of fun as Cockroach Poker with this game. Uh, this game is a bit more of a learning curve. I found. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that there's player elimination here and not so much in Cockroach Poker doesn't make Skull everyone's taste yep. because you only get eliminated with Skull. It's kind of your own fault because you push too hard to try and push for that victory. Mm-hmm. And when you stuff up by hitting someone else's Skull, you lose a coaster. So you only have yourself to blame. But if you're playing this game at six players, you get out, you're the first one out, you kind of are stuck waiting around that yeah. 10 minutes for yeah. that game, next game to start. Uh, and then people might not want to jump straight into the next game. You might want a little breather, things like that. So it does mm. suffer from player elimination, I'd say. Yep. Uh, but if you're okay with that, which I am, thankfully, <laughs> this game's an absolute loss. Hey, I mean, if it's a game you're playing at a pub, that's just an excuse to go to the bar and refresh your drink. Yeah, and I have played this at a pub quite a few times. It's really good for well, that. Speaking of, we played this with real coasters at the bar. Well, <laughs> we literally, yeah. got, someone had a pen and we drew it on the each coaster. That was your skull. That's what, that's <laughs> what yeah. my mind immediately went to. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. And that's what I was literally about to say. So let's get into our discussion topic for tonight, which is we're going to talk about uh, games that you can take to your local pub, to your local tavern, to your cl- local club if you wanted to. Uh, you know, and why you may want to do that. Why this is something that we pro- we recommend. Um, and what games would be great. And this is the, the perfect example because it literally is four coasters per player. Yeah. Go grab some coasters, grab a pen, and then draw a fancy skull, make your own skull and some flowers that are all kind of the same, and you've got yourself a game. Mm-hmm. Like, yep. how cool is that? You can go to your local pub with nothing but a pen and then create a whole game out from, from nothing, right? And so, yeah, and because they're actual coasters, you could actually use them as coasters if you really wanted to you could actually you know i mean i wouldn't use the the game to be board. fair they're about the same price as a normal set of coasters yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah uh, you know if you really want to go to the local pub and you know sw- you know swipe four coasters per player and like you really could yeah. and just have to play the game um but you know i mean we're not if, condoning that <laughs> well, they're, fr- that they're free there. coasters are free they put them all over the cr- crappy cardboard but point being going to your local pub and playing games have you guys ever done it? I mean, I know you. I mean, I think you have, Ralph. I mean, I don't yeah. know about you, Blake, but have you ever done it? Have there any games? But what? And also, then, what reasons do we think people would like to do it? Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, not specifically board games. I've never had that sort of group of friends. I mean, you know, we've always gone to the pub, and you know, you obviously you play things like pool and that. But no, I've never um, even even thought about bringing you know different kinds of board games or card games or things to the pub to play, but it sounds like a fantastic idea. I can definitely see the appeal of it. I mean, the, the, the environment, the, you know, having a couple of drinks, especially when you're playing these sorts of, if you're playing these sorts of bluffing games, it gets ratty real quick and I can see, I see the fun. Yeah, it really is. Um, I'm the type of guy that pretty much always has board games in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, who knew? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have one green wool shopping bag of like small box games that yeah. I like to just put in my bag when I'm like going anywhere. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Oh, I've got yeah, a game. That's it. Play. That's it. Hundred yeah. uh, percent. I did. I think the first couple of weeks I had cockroach poker. I took that to a pub. That game doesn't work at a pub. I I found because you know halfway through the game everyone's got like ten cards in front of them. Mm. Doesn't quite work. Yeah. Uh, Skull is perfect for that. 
Um, so that extreme that works extremely well at the pub. Um, I do want to talk about a game. Um, it's called Il Vino Morte, Ooh. which is uh, a, an Italian game, but basically it translates to the wine death. <laughs> okay. So okay. It's, interested. I always am fascinated by games that are just a small deck of cards, like Love Letter, right? Mm -hmm. So, but what it is, is each player gets a card in front of them. They do not get to look at that card, okay? They can either flip the card and drink the wine, because it's a bottle of wine, or they can swap it with another player, okay? So you play this with as many players as you want. Mm -hmm. um, one of the bottle of wines is poison. So you can either drink the wine in front of you or swap it with another player. And then at the end of, when it gets back to your turn, at the end of the round, everyone flips their card. If you're poisoned, you're out of the game. And then you go again until the last player. This game is fantastic. Out of <laughs> 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 it's, it's dumb Russian roulette, but it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's perfect for a pub. <laughs> and, you know, I can, I can see the, it just, it's, when it comes to that game, that sort of reveal mechanic, I, I, come to love that mechanic in games you know we talked about before with you know the quacks the bag revealing cubes or, or you know f trying to flip the coasters to see whether you got a skull that tension yeah that tension just before the reveal i think there's very few experiences that beat that sort of experience in a game yeah yeah i think the pub also has a really good so here in australia if you're listening from international our pub culture is very much so we have a very big club culture as well so a lot of people will go to a local like hotel or a local club to have their drinks but there are a lot of taverns and pubs around the place um, especially in the city and uh, out west where we are um, but especially overseas I've actually had been very lucky to have a proper like like uh, pub um, gaming adventure when I was overseas in, in the UK um, and this is some of the reasons why you would like it so I was at my sister and sister-in-law's um, house over in uh, she lives in a little um, a little town just outside of Winchester in the UK and literally about 200, 300 meters down from their house is the local pub. And the pub was called the, the Ship Inn. And when I say it's a, like a proper old English pub, it's like the, the ceiling is only six foot one. <laughs> so as a six foot five man myself, <laughs> like I have to bend under all the, the cross beams. Um, but they've, I've got to admit, they got it right over there. Mm. So their pubs are all like, you know, you know, they have tab culture. So, you know, you open a tab with them and do that. And then it was in the middle of winter. Uh, actually, no, sorry, it wasn't the middle of winter. It was summer for them, but it was like towards the um, end of summer yeah. coming into autumn. So it was actually kind of pretty cold. So we would actually walk down from the my sister-in-law's house with a game of Garnish on Clever. And we went into the pub and we sat by the window with the fire roaring and we whipped out the game. We were literally playing it for about an hour and a half and we just order a beer or two. They bring it over and we'd be playing the game and then... A couple of people would come by and ask us, hey, what's that? And we'd tell them it's, yeah, sexy artsy, as we like to do on this podcast. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> and then, you know, we'd have, and we'd get another round, and we and then we kept playing. We played for about a good hour and a half, two hours, and then we left. And what was really cool about it was the, it's kind of really surreal, like, play, because it, it kind of makes it an event yeah. without being a fancy event, right? You know, like, I can go and, like, have Georgie, play a board game, right? So let's play a game. What game do you want to play? Oh, I don't know. Let's play, you know, Seven Wonders Duel or Splendid Duel, whatever. A two-play game. We go grab it off the shelf, come to our table, we set it up, and maybe we have a drink or something like that, and then we finish, and then, oh, okay, back to the couch, and mm -hmm. we go and, you know, watch TV or whatever. But when we went to the pub, it felt like a thing mm. to do it was not like you know it's, it's kind of hard to explain it felt like an event yeah it felt it's like an outing it, yeah. it felt like an outing right it felt like we are going to the pub to spend time together and the event that we wanted to play is play this game together yeah and there was actually really like if you're listening to this and you have a partner and you're thinking oh you know like legitimately just go to a location play the game and then you're at like the local tavern or whatnot get a couple of drinks and actually make an event of it mm. i really can't recommend it enough it was really cool to do because you know the you've got the the vibe and the culture of like the other people around you so you've got like the murmur of people around you and yeah. you're playing a game you've got beers in hand i mean in australia you know you can grab go grab your pub schnitty you know yeah grab that get that come over eat it whilst you're going and i don't know about you guys but something about like taking a game 
out of your house and into the wild, if you will. <laughs> I don't know. Something about that just makes me go. It, it, like I said, it turns it from just this is a game to an event. Yeah, and I and I really like that. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely something that's you know I've sort of well, I guess now I open my eyes to. I'm definitely will be doing it. I can. I've already started. You guys have pulled me in. I've already started. Every time I go out, I look at my. I'll be at limited shelf at the moment and go, which game can I bring? Which game can I put yeah, in the car? Cool. Not just to, you know, because I've planned to, but just in case we get to a point. You never know. <laughs> I have got this to play. Who, who's up for a game? That's you know, it. I've already started that. My collection started to go. So no, I definitely will be mm. going to a pub and making it an event. <laughs> Actually, um, I, I, I've done the same thing as you just mentioned. The, um, my cousin Anthony and I, we literally just break out Fugitive. If, if we've got a couple of hours oh, to kill love, it and we're at the bar, love, love fugitive. Um, we've played Fugitive on a number of occasions because it's literally, you can play it in a small space and a little a little bar stool table sort of thing because uh, only one player is actually playing the cards mm. and another player is just ticking boxes. Um, but I've also had a, uh, like I've played some roll and rights like Railroad Inc um, mm. as well because that's quite portable and um, just lots of little things like that. Um, I've even like, we kind of, my wife and I went to a cafe and we were like, oh, we're way too early for this, but we can still sit outside. We can't really go home at the moment. We were like doing things. I got Reza Arcana in the car. Do you want to just play it? And I'm like, yeah, all right. Um, so we've played that, uh, just waiting for a, a cafe to open up. That's great. <laughs> right. We had the similar sort of thing, which is we were down, um, we flew to Adelaide for a engagement party um, and we were all staying at the hotel, myself, my family, and um some extended family excuse me and we <laughs> excuse me uh so we i then went and found oh there's actually a little game store just around the corner from the hotel so i literally went to the game store and i'm like saw the mind and i went oh I yeah that, that works well i've heard about the mind and i got it and then we came back up to like the uh, just like the the, the the you know the, the the eating area of the hotel and there was nothing going on at that moment but we we're just kind of loitering around didn't really have much to do and i said hey i've got bought this game called The Mind, you all want to play. And then I was like, yeah, how do we play it? And then one thing led to another, and all of a sudden we have us, like, around the table, everyone with cards in their mm. hand, and then teaching these people how to play, mm. how, my family how to play a game. Like, games are so good at providing, you know, I say, like, something to do. Yeah. But they're also very good at also as I keep talking about, like these shared experiences, because mm. we can all go, hey, remember that time when we played that game and when we didn't have anything to do? Like, oh, remember that time we went to the pub and we played Fugitive and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, there's a lot of memories being created out of this. And I think sometimes playing a game at your home, the game itself needs to be good. Otherwise, they can be quite forgettable. Mm. But by taking it somewhere you know you and you know the fact that you have res arcana in the cast like we went to a cafe and they were closed and then we decided what the hell let's play a game right like yeah. that that novelty in and of itself yeah like i remember that game better than i remember the ones i played at home for sure yeah exactly um, like i just want to flip it a little bit a uh, different perspective on this a lot of the venues actually like that too um mm. so as you know Nee, we i've been organizing the blood on the clock tower at ingleburn bowling club Yep. Uh, and they're more than thrilled to have us there because we go through drinks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the beer shed at Lumia is uh, at Ingl yeah Lumia. Yeah, Lumia. Um, yep. They're actually open to having actual board games there. They got a little section. Then, like you know what, we're open. You want to come in and set up Catan? Go for it. Yeah. Um, because people are buying drinks. Um, so the venues are actually liking the fact that it gets people to the venue. Mm. If you know, if you're happy to spend three hours here. Go for it, <laughs> which yeah. is really cool. Yeah, and I think as well, in a post-COVID world, a lot of people have gotten very insular, and, un and rightly so, right? And people have been worried for quite a few years, but now as we come out of the other end, a lot of people are now starting to think, and a lot of local businesses, are, like you said, mm. are starting to go, hey, we need to get people in the door. How do we get them mm. in the door? And every basic, every like hospitality venue... It's got a table and chairs. Yep. yep. 
Oh, mate, if, I, like you, if you let me bring a drink, or let me bring my game, I will go buy your stuff. No, yeah. I think it's not every place welcomes it. Like if it's a place no, that's a, a very busy cafe, they want people in and out. They're not going to want you to open no, a deck of cards. Yeah. No, but, that's right. And this is why we're kind of talking about pub culture, pubs and taverns. Like the idea of like, this is a place for you to come and be with people mm. like and hang with your friends and then we'll provide you some drinks. Like that's what I, I think a lot of pubs and taverns obviously are. Like they are not... Like, you're right, Ralph. Cafes are very much, we're here to serve you food. You get in, you or, whilst you're ordering food and ordering stuff, we want you in and out. Most yeah. cafes are. But pubs are not like that. Pubs want you there yeah. because they want, it doesn't matter, if, like, so long as you're buying drinks, they don't care. Or yeah. they're buying food or, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, those kind of places. I think, is there any other games that you have that you think would be good, Ralph, to take to a pub? I mean, you are probably the resident expert in playing a lot of games, but are there any games you can think off the top of your head that would be really good? Um, yeah, there's a couple. Um, generally, any sort of quick card game, not a lot of table f- space required. People that get uh, like little bluffing games or people that get people physically involved in a way, yep. it's just funny. Uh, so if you can do that while drinking, uh, I'm not talking about like your throw throw burritos or anything <laughs> like that. Because if you do that while drunk, someone's falling down the stairs. Uh, <laughs> security will probably ask you to let please, sir. Yeah, you might hit the security guard yeah. with a burrito. Well, maybe cool. he'll play, but even then, I don't. I don't want to cop the security guard throwing a burrito at my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, like any games you can think of. Like obviously, I've said Gancho and Clever. Uh, I mean, Skull is obviously a great one. Um, are there any other games that yeah you could recommend to people that uh, a fugitive? You've already said any other ones on top of that. Um, yeah, I'd recommend a game that I've got with me tonight actually to show you guys. So this game is I'd say fairly well known uh, in the board game terms of the last few years. It is called Taco Cat Goat Cheese Pizza, and I'm just going to teach you how to play because it's so simple. Imagine we're drinking, we're all drunk, don't have the attention span. One of you's falling asleep. Um, I'm like, hey, you bring out this deck of cards. Um, this is, You can tell them this is Snap. Uh, but you flip the card from your hand and you say the word taco. Okay, but the picture is actually of a cat or a goat or a cheese or a pizza. Right. Any one of those. But so I say taco, then it'll be Nee's turn. And I have to say cat. Yeah. And if, if that was a cat, if that matched, you snap it. Right. Okay. okay right, so, right, But you have right, to go right, in right. order. So taco, cat, goat, cheese... Goat pizza like you have to say it in order at any point if you say the wrong word if i say taco cat and then you say pizza which is incorrect you take the pile because you stuffed up the momentum of the of the thing okay Mm -hmm. there are some if i snap the pile what happens do i get the pile or do i give it to someone oh sorry um i might have this a little bit wrong um if you're yeah no if you're the last player to snap it you take the pile ah uh, yeah okay so everyone's got to snap it if you're the last player to snap you my get the poor pile. dainty hands <laughs> so the winner is the person who gets rid of the deck uh, from their hand yep but they have to be the first player to snap right okay when you have no cards in your hand yeah but you still have to say the words harker cat goat cheese pizza yeah but you still, you don't play a card mm. it's harder than you think there are some special ones. That's a groundhog. That's a groundhog. <laughs> when you play the groundhog, everyone has to like pound their knuckles <laughs> on, the, drum roll. on the table, yeah, like yeah. a little drum roll. If you're the last player to do that, or you do the wrong thing, you take the pile. <laughs> okay. So there's three different ones. This is a narwhal. What that one is, is you have to like clamp your hands on your forehead like you're a unicorn. Okay. Well, like you're a narwhal yeah, in this yeah. case. If you're the last player to do that, you take the pile. And the last one, I will it? find it. One oh. second. It's what is it? I'm oh the gorilla. The gorilla. Of course. That is, you beat your chest like Donkey Kong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you're the last player to do that, you take the pile. That is the game. Okay. But if you have no cards in your hand and someone was to play the gorilla, you have to be the first player to uh, slap your chest. You play this game while drinking at a pub. It is just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that getting pretty crazy pretty quickly. Yeah, it's a silly kids game. Kids love it. You can play it not at the pub, sure, but it's better if you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that I think are better at the pub than they're doing at home. But that's for a different podcast and maybe for when we open up Patreon and they're Patreons only. Who knows? <laughs> uh, I don't know where I'm going with that. I was trying to come up with something fun to, to bring it to the I don't think people podcast. want to pay to see that thing. <laughs> 
talking about talking, but that's all right. I was, oh, okay. Yeah. Or drinking drinking beer is better at a pub rather than drinking beer at home. That is true. So, that is true. I don't know what you guys were thinking about. God. Oh, we've been doing. Oh God, this we're getting this. We're all going crazy now. We've all had the faux pas. We've all are getting crazy. So I think it's time for us to wrap it up there. If you did enjoy tonight's podcast, thank you so much for listening. We hope you listen to more. Please go to our website, which is www.boardgamegateway.com. There you'll find links to all of our social medias, Facebook, YouTube, uh, our Discord server as well. Um, we are hoping to become a lot more active this year and we're getting uh, back into the groove of things. Uh, but look, if you did enjoy it, please give us a rating on, uh, on iTunes and Spotify, all that fun stuff. I'm going to say goodbye before these guys start building more card pyramids and uh, interrupting my, <laughs> my flow. Damn it, Blake. Uh, with that, I'm going to say bye. I can't but- get this at all. <laughs> <laughs> bye, guys. See you next week. See everyone. Uh, I had to build it. I had to build it. I mean, I had to build it.